We want to continue to worship the Lord this morning by hearing his word, and so I invite you to take your Bible and turn with me to Romans chapter 9. We want to make sure that you have a copy of the notes uh, so that you can follow along. So our ushers have uh, the notes uh, ready to hand out uh, to you if you need a copy of the notes. Uh, the ushers will get that into your hand. So Keith, we have several on this side, several on this side over here. Thank you for uh, Burdett. If you need a Bible, please let uh, the ushers know as well. And we would uh, love to send you home with a Bible as a gift from Grace Church. Now as we come to Romans chapter 9, you can see in the title of the sermon notes, Is God Done with Israel? Because Romans chapters 9 through 11 deal with God's program for the nation of Israel. God's program for the nation of Israel. And so in our next several studies, we will be thinking through what uh, the scriptures reveal here in Romans chapter 9 through 11 about God's program for the nation of Israel. But by way of introduction, I think you are aware that anti-Semitism, that is hatred for the Jews, uh, hatred for the nation of Israel, is actually on the rise. Uh, unfortunately, it's um, fomented uh, here in our own country, and uh, it's largely fomented on our university campuses. And uh, we, are, we are seeing it uh, beginning to increase in, uh, in number of incidences as well as the, the, the intensity of the hatred for uh, the nation of Israel and for the Jewish people. Now, this isn't anything new in history. In fact, as I want to share with you this morning, in 1543, Martin Luther the leader of the Protestant Reformation published a pamphlet titled On the Jews and Their Lies. Early in his ministry, Luther was sympathetic to the Jews, believing that they would convert to Christianity. And when they did not, Luther uh, was embittered towards the Jewish people. And in this pamphlet, Luther advocated expelling the Jews from Germany as well as destroying their synagogues and religious books. Here's an excerpt from his pamphlet. First, their synagogue should be set on fire, and whatever is left be buried in the dirt, so that no one may be able to see a stone or cinder from it. Jewish prayer books should be destroyed. Then the Jewish people should be dealt with. Their homes smashed and destroyed. Jews should be banned from the roads and markets, should be drafted into forced labor, and made to earn their bread by the sweat of their noses. They live by evil and plunder. They are wicked beasts that ought to be driven out like mad dogs. In the last resort, they should be kicked out for all time. 400 years later, when the Nazis came to power in Germany, they actually used the writings of Luther and other Christian theologians to justify their anti-Semitism. The infamous Nazi death camp, Dachau, greeted the Jews arriving there with a sign that read, You are here because you killed our God. Now, Martin Luther was hardly the first anti-Semitic leader in Christendom. I don't know if you understand this, but anti-Semitism actually began in the church in the second century A.D. You might think that anti-Semitism grew uh, with the development of Islam in the sixth and seventh century A.D. No, anti-Semitism began in the Christian church in the second century A.D., most of the early church fathers were disciples of Plato and Socrates and other Greek philosophers. Ignatius, Origen, Justin Martyr, Marcion, and John Chrysostom all began to teach what we today call replacement theology. Now, replacement theology teaches that God rejected Israel because Israel rejected Jesus. And replacement theology then goes on to say that the church replaces Israel in God's program. And replacement theology is based on 
allegorizing and spiritualizing huge passages in the Old Testament concerning the unfulfilled promises and covenant commitments that God made to Israel and spiritualizing those away and saying those are being spiritually fulfilled in the church today. It is built on allegorization. It's built on a horrible, horrible misinterpretation of vast swaths of Scripture. And so the early church fathers were really the genesis of anti-Semitism in the church in the second century and forward. They were overtly anti-Semitic. As an example, Justin Martyr stated in his letter to a Greek Jew named Trypho, God gave the Jews the Torah as punishment for their exceptional wickedness and because of his special hatred of the Jewish people. We too would observe your Sabbath days and festivals if it were not for the reason that we are aware of the reason they were imposed upon you, namely, because of your wickedness and hard hearts. I don't know that if that's stunning to you that an early church father would say that God hates the Jews. That is astounding and it's sickening. Now tragically, both the Roman Catholic Church and later the Protestant Christian Church in Europe have been the cause of great suffering for Jews over the last 2,000 years because of replacement theology. Replacement theology is taught in the Roman Catholic Church and it continues to be taught in mainline Protestant denominations. It is associated with the false teachings of covenant theology, strict and hyper-Calvinism, and amillennialism, the denial that there is a future messianic kingdom. And folks, it is not a minor issue. There are Christians today who want to say, let's all get along. This is just a minor issue. It's not a salvation issue, but I say to you, it's a major issue. It's a major issue because replacement theology blasphemes the character of God as a promise breaker. And I say to you, it's not a minor issue because the issue of replacement theology is based on allegorization of the scripture. It is a direct violation of Paul's admonition that we be careful students of God's word. And the only way replacement theology can exist is, as I have said, spiritualizing away, allegorizing away huge swaths of God's word in order to make it fit this idea that God has rejected Israel because Israel rejected Jesus. In fact, when you read the scriptures in its historical, grammatical, literary context, we discover in the Old Testament that Israel's rejection of Messiah was prophesied in Isaiah 53. It was known to God as part of his program, and even though the nation of Israel would initially reject the Messiah, the scriptures also clearly teach that there's coming a day when the nation of Israel will acknowledge and trust in Jesus Christ as their Messiah. It's there in the scriptures if we just plainly read the scriptures. So at the heart of this issue is, is God done with Israel? Now, the reason why this issue comes up in the letter of Romans is because in the day of the Apostle Paul, in the late 50s AD, when he wrote this letter to the church in Rome, Israel as a nation was in a state of unbelief. As you know from the Gospels, led by their spiritual leaders, the nation of Israel rejected Jesus' claims and his validations to be the Messiah, and with the help of the Romans, had Jesus crucified. So
So as a nation led by our spiritual leaders, the nation of Israel did reject Jesus as the Messiah. Jesus was crucified. He accomplished our salvation by burying in his body our sins on the cross. He was buried, and on the third day he rose again. He lived and taught amongst his disciples for 40 days, and then he ascended into heaven where he presently is at the right hand of the Father. And Israel to this day remains in a state of unbelief as a nation. She remains in a state of unbelief. And in fact, in Paul's day, Israel is just a few years away from experiencing divine punishment for the rejection of Messiah in the invasion and conquest of the Romans in 70 AD. In 70 AD, she will be wiped off the map as a nation among the nations. And so the question comes on the heels of Romans 8, 31 through 39, where Paul has said to believers, Gentiles and Jews, that there's nothing that can separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus. Well, then somebody looks at the nation of Israel to whom God made very specific promises, has four unconditional covenants that he has made with her, and yet she is in a state of unbelief. Rather than receiving the messianic kingdom, she is still subjugated to Rome. She's still rejecting the Messiah. And she is not experiencing God's blessings, the blessings that are promised to her in the Old Testament scriptures. Does this mean, in fact, that God has rejected Israel? You see, it goes to the issue of God's trustworthiness. If he has made these promises to Israel concerning the Messiah and their future kingdom, and they haven't been fulfilled, then how can we be confident that, in fact, nothing can separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus? If Israel had these promises from God, and God doesn't fulfill these promises because of their unbelief, then how can we be confident that nothing can separate us from the love of Christ? Because let me ask you this, do you live the Christian life perfectly? Do you obey the Spirit and the Word perfectly? Do you always believe God in every circumstance and situation and never doubt? Then how can you be confident that God won't break His promise to you to conform you to the image of His Son, to raise you from the dead, to be with Him forever? If he'll break his promise to Israel, then why are you confident he won't break his promise to you? You see, that's the issue. That's why we're dealing with this question of the nation of Israel here as we come to Romans chapter 9 through chapter 11. These are the questions that Paul answers. And that's why we're talking about God's program for the nation of Israel. Now, as we come to verses 1 through 6, which is our text of study this morning, the first thing we see, I think my voice just broke. I thought I was over that. But the first thing that we see is Paul's heart for his Jewish brethren. In verses 1 through 3, we, we, we read, I am speaking the truth in Christ. I am not lying. My conscience bears me witness in the Holy Spirit that I have great sorrow and unceasing anguish in my heart. For I could wish that I myself were accursed and cut off from Christ for the sake of my brothers, my kinsmen according to the flesh. We see here Paul's heart for his Jewish brethren, how his heart breaks for their condition of being in unbelief and under God's wrath. You need to understand that after his conversion, Paul was viewed as a traitor by his fellow Israelites. Soon after his conversion, the Jews attempted to murder Paul in Damascus. And their hatred for Paul just continued to grow until it, it, it blew up in Jerusalem years later, and it led to Paul's uh, incarceration, and ultimately his being taken to Rome in chains to stand before Caesar. The Jews hated Paul. They saw him as a traitor to everything that he 
uh, used to believe in everything that the nation of Israel stood for because he, he accepted that Jesus is the Messiah. And even though the Jews believe that he is a traitor, Paul is expressing here that he is no traitor to his people. He loves them dearly. And he aches, and he would be willing to substitute himself and be accursed, be anathema, if that would lead to the nation being saved through faith in Jesus the Messiah. That's what he longs for, for his people. Now in verses 4 and 5, Paul affirms the unique relationship that God has with the nation of Israel. And he lists eight privileges that God has exclusively given to the nation of Israel. Let's read together verses 4 and 5. They are Israelites, and to them belong the adoption, the glory, the covenants, the giving of the law, the worship, and the promises. To them belong the patriarchs, and from their race, according to the flesh, is the Christ, who is God over all, blessed forever. Amen. Paul first asserts that they are Israelites, which is considered an honor by the Jews to be an Israelite. Now, you need to understand that an Israelite is a descendant of Abraham through whom? Isaac and Jacob. And so to this people group, God has given eight privileges. First, Paul talks of the adoption the adoption refers to Israel's national adoption as the national son of God. Uh, listen to God as he speaks to Moses. And the Lord said to Moses in Exodus chapter 4, When you go back to Egypt, see that you do before Pharaoh all the miracles that I, ha I have put in your power. But I will harden his heart so that he will not let the people go. Then you shall say to Pharaoh, Thus says the Lord, Israel is my firstborn son. Israel is my firstborn son. And I say to you, let my son go that he may serve me. If you refuse to let him go, behold, I will kill your firstborn son. And so this is the adoption, just as we as individuals in this dispensation, are adopted as the children of God on an individual basis. So at this time in history, God adopted the nation of Israel as his national firstborn son. This is also where we get the idea of the chosen people, that the Israelites, the Jews, the descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob are the chosen people. They stand in a unique relationship among all the people groups of the world. They stand in a unique relationship with God the Father. Paul goes on to say, in addition to the adoption, God also gave Israel the glory. But what does the glory refer to? It refers to God's Shekinah glory. It is described as overwhelming light. And it is his localized presence. And again, in Exodus 40, we have this description. Then the cloud covered the tent of meeting, and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. And Moses was not able to enter the tent of meeting because the cloud settled on it, and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. Throughout all their journeys, whenever the cloud was taken up from over the tabernacle, the people of Israel would set out. But if the cloud was not taken up, then they did not set out till the day that it was taken up. For the cloud of the Lord was on the tabernacle by day, and fire was in it by night, in the sight of the house of Israel throughout all their journeys. Just think about that. Just think about the privilege of being the people with whom God dwelt. Wherever your tent was in the encampment, you would look to the center of the camp, and there you would see at night the fire, the presence of God, the Shekinah glory. And during the day when you would look, you would see the cloud, the Shekinah glory, the presence of God in the midst of your camp. 
But stop and think about the glory we have today because we have the Holy Spirit who dwells where? In us. That's been the desire of God from the creation of man to be with us and for us to be with him. And that's why it sorrows his heart whenever we do not want him, we do not believe him, we do not embrace him. It breaks the heart of God who wants to be with his people. And this unique nation, his national son, Israel, God chose to express his presence in the Shekinah glory that dwelt in their midst in the tabernacle and later in the temple when they settle in the land. The next privilege are the covenants. Paul says that God has given to Israel the covenants, and you'll notice that they're plural, not singular, they're plural. The covenants refer to the four unconditional covenants God has made with the nation of Israel. And the four unconditional covenants are the Abrahamic, Land, Davidic, and New Covenant. And folks, if you don't understand these, these four covenants, then you are, you are handicapped in understanding God's story. You are handicapped in understanding the scriptures. Because these four covenants are the key to the dispensations, the different administrations of God's program down through human history. These four covenants are the key to future events. The reason why there are future events is because of these four covenants in which God made unconditional promises to the nation of Israel that he will fulfill. And if you don't understand the four unconditional covenants, you're handicapped. You're not under, going to understand much of what you're reading in the scriptures. And that's why with everything that's in me, I encourage you to study this study by Dr. Arnold Fruchtenbaum called The Eight Covenants of the Bible. I am not exaggerating when I say to you, this is one of the most important essential studies you will ever do in your Christian life. This is a key to understanding that our God is a covenant-keeping God. And this is the key to understanding much of the scriptures. And because so many theologians and Bible teachers, and as a result, seminaries, do not take seriously the four covenants, it produces great confusion in how we are to relate to a fifth covenant called the Mosaic Covenant and things like the Ten Commandments and keeping the Sabbath day holy. And we don't know what to do with that because we've been mistaught because we don't understand that that fifth covenant no longer is operative. These, this study here, the eight covenants, and I have copies here in the front, I urge you with everything in me to study this. Because it is a game changer when you understand the covenants of God that he has made with mankind and specifically with the nation of Israel. It will explain so much of what you're reading in both the Old and the New Testaments. And so they're here, uh, and I've also given you where you can find this study online as well at ariel.org. Now again, replacement theologians, covenant theologians, completely ignore these four unconditional covenants that God has made with the nation of Israel, and they substitute a concocted covenant that doesn't exist in Scripture called the covenant of grace. How many of you have been in a church where you've been taught about the covenant of grace? Okay? You were taught something that's not in Scripture. And yet, for replacement theology and covenant theologians, they have to concoct that covenant in order to make a construct by which to understand God's story. All we need to do, brothers and sisters, is just simply study what's there. Simply take seriously what God has, the covenants that God has made, and understand what the promises are. We don't need to concoct anything. Okay, now you're getting me riled up. Stop it. Stop it. All right, you understand how deeply I believe in the value of this study. And so I encourage you to pick up a copy at the close of the service today. Next, Paul says the privilege, God gave them the, the fifth privilege, or the, the fourth privilege, rather, is the giving of the law. And this is the law of Moses, and it's connected to a fifth covenant, a conditional covenant, 
God revealed his righteousness through 613 laws contained in the law of Moses and also part and parcel of the Mosaic Covenant. And the Mosaic Covenant is a conditional covenant in that God says to the nation of Israel, if you will obey my commands, I will bless you. If you obey my commands, I will bless you. If you disobey my commands, I will curse you. I will discipline you. Now, if you understand that about the Mosaic Covenant, then now you understand much of the Old Testament. Now you understand why in the Old Testament there is constant judgment and discipline experienced by the nation of Israel because when she lacked spiritual leadership, she fell into apostasy and idolatry and God disciplined her over and over and over again per the conditions of the Mosaic Covenant. Now... The Mosaic Covenant came to an end with the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ who has inaugurated the New Covenant. The Old Covenant, the Mosaic Covenant, is no longer operative. That's why we're no longer under the Ten Commandments. That clears up a lot, doesn't it, about the Sabbath. We're not under the Sabbath command because the Law of Moses has come to an end in the finished work of Jesus Christ. That's all in this study. And so God has privileged the nation of Israel with these unconditional covenants that have promises that are not yet fulfilled that are the basis of the future events that we see in both the Old and the New Testaments. God keeps his promises. He does not break his unconditional promises. I need a little bottle of oxygen right, right there. The fifth privilege that God has granted to the nation of Israel, Paul describes as the worship. And this has to do with God showing Israel how to worship him in holiness and in righteousness in the tabernacle and later in the temple. And so it includes the worship calendar and events like the Passover and the seven feasts of the Lord. It includes also the, uh, the priesthood, it includes all the various um, sacrifices and how they are to be presented and also includes the grain offerings and the thanksgiving offerings and, and all the things related to how to worship God in holiness and in righteousness. The sixth privilege is the promises. Now the promises refer primarily to the promises regarding the Messiah, which go clear back to Genesis 3.15 in the seed of the woman and comes all the way through. And these promises have to do with the first coming of the Messiah, the second coming of the Messiah, the setting up of his kingdom here on the earth, when he will regather Israel into the land and settle her there in security and prosperity and rule over not only Israel in righteousness, but all the nations of the earth. There are so many prophecies in the Old Testament so many promises to Israel that God will regather her and restore her in the land one day. These are the promises that God has made to the nation of Israel and that will be fulfilled in the Messiah. The seventh privilege is the patriarchs. The patriarchs refer to whom? Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And the Jewish nation, to be a Jew, means to be a descendant of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And it is on the, on the basis of the patriarchs that God established the nation of Israel. The eighth privilege is the Christ. And the Christ is the Greek term that corresponds to the Hebrew term, Mashiach, or Messiah. That it is from the Jewish people, from the descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, that the Messiah, the Deliverer, would come one day. And so first of all, we observe that the Messiah must be what? Jewish, ethnically. He is a Jew. He's a descendant of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. But notice also that Paul says the Messiah is God over all. So not only is he a human being who is a Jew, but he is also who? He is God. He is divine. And Jesus is that Messiah because he proved himself to be fully human, descended from the Jews, from the line of David, and he is fully God, as he validated through his miracles and through his teaching. 
Jesus is the promised Messiah. And he was promised to come through and is one of the privileges of the Jewish people to be the source of the Messiah, not only for themselves, but for the entire world. Now, in recounting these eight privileges, Paul is emphasizing the unique and privileged relationship Israel has with God. But at the same time, the fact that they have these eight privileges points out the tragedy that the nation of Israel has rejected her Messiah, the Lord Jesus Christ. With all this that God had given, they have failed to recognize the Messiah when he came in his first coming. Now the good news is, they will recognize him one day as a nation when he comes again to rescue the nation of Israel at the end of the tribulation. Now, how tragic is it that at the time that Paul is writing this letter to the Romans, the Jews, the nation of Israel, remains under God's wrath and in just a few years will suffer divine punishment in the conquest of 70 A.D. by the Romans. And again, the question then comes to mind, does that mean that God has rejected Israel? Does that mean, and there are many people down through human history who would say what? Yes. In fact, this, I, 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 I have a hard time wrapping my head around this. With World Wars I and II, we have seen the fulfillment of Jesus' prophetic word that kingdom will rise against kingdom and nation against nation. That, that prophecy has been fulfilled in World Wars I and II. And what is the lasting effect of World Wars I and II? the reestablishment of the nation of Israel. Now that's stunning because that has never happened in the history of nations before in world history. Now, does that seem to you and to me to be consistent with God's program for Israel where he promises that he will regather the people not once but twice that he will enter into judgment with them. That's the tribulation period. And at the end of that tribulation period, Zechariah says that the nation will look upon whom they pierced. And they will be undone. And they will come to faith as a nation in the Messiah. Now they have to be regathered as a nation. And God has already regathered them and continues to regather them in the land. And how can people who see this historic miracle deny that it has any meaning at all, prophetically? And yet that is exactly the position of those who hold to replacement theology. The reestablishment of the nation of Israel and the regathering of the Jews into the land for replacement theologians means nothing. And my mouth just drops and says, how can that be? This is a momentous, historical miracle that's consistent with the fulfillment of God's program for Israel. I, is, that, is that a leap? Is that a stretch? No. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to jump again. So even though Israel, as a state, as a nation, continues in unbelief, even since the days of Paul, God is not done with Israel. God loves Israel. God will fulfill his covenant promises to Israel. And this is what Paul declares in the next phrase in verse 6, Romans 9. But it is not as though the word of God has failed. To say it another way, Paul is saying the word of God to Israel has not failed. The term failed there means to fade away. It is not faded away. As he will explain later in Romans uh, 10 and 11, 
Israel is undergoing a time of partial hardening. Why? Because it is a time when God is drawing in the Gentiles. This is all part of God's larger plan for Israel. He is not done with Israel. God keeps his promises. And even though Israel is in a state of unbelief, God is not going to break his promises to her. And that is why you and I can have 100% confidence that nothing can separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus. That is why you and I can be 100% confident that even when we fail and we sin and we struggle with doubts, and we struggle to believe God and we struggle to be faithful to God, He will always be faithful to you because He is not a promise breaker. He is a promise keeper. And we see that first and for excuse me, we see that first and foremost <coughs> in his relationship with the nation of Israel. God is not done with Israel. God will fulfill his covenant promises to his beloved people. That's the basis of our confidence that God will fulfill his promise to us that we will rise in the resurrection, we will receive our redemption bodies, we will be conformed to the image of His Son. We will be with God the Father, God the Son, God the Spirit, the holy angels, and all the saints for the rest of eternity. God keeps His promises. Now, I want to say two things in closing. First of all, we can be critical of Israel and say, with these eight privileges, how in the world did they miss it? Okay, that's a legitimate question. But unless we be too harsh and too critical, the question for us is, with all of the blessings and resources that God has given us today, we have the fulfilled scriptures. We have the 66 books of the inspired word of God in our possession today. We have the indwelling Holy Spirit we have the fellowship and love of the church family. Are we responding to God in faith with all that he has blessed us with and heaped on us? All of these resources, are we responding as we ought to the word and spirit of God? Let us not be overcritical of Israel, but let's be honest and introspective about ourselves with all that God has blessed us with. Are we responding to the spirit and word as we ought? And the second thing is, when we talk about the nation of Israel and that God is not done, but he's fulfilling her covenant promises, please understand that that does not mean a carte blanche agreement with all of the decisions that the government of Israel makes or is making. Do you, need to, you need to understand that. It's not a carte blanche agreement agreement that everything that they're doing as a nation and their government does is right and good. Okay? That's naive. Uh, they still need to, and unfortunately, they're still separated from God. They're not, they're not following uh, God's word. Uh, so just like our government, they're to be held to account for uh, the kind of decisions that they make from a governmental standpoint all the way down but they are still God's chosen people and God will fulfill his promises to her let's pray together father along with the apostle Paul we we do pray for the salvation of Israel we do pray for ministries like aerial ministries and chosen people ministries that are reaching out, out, out of love for your people with the gospel of Jesus, that, Father, that many would trust in Christ as their Savior. Help us as a church to be um, supportive of those ministries that are in direct contact uh, with Jewish men and women and children. And Father, encourage us with this message today 
that you keep your promises. You never break your promises. Those promises that are based on your word and your word alone, you will fulfill. And you will fulfill your promises to us. Help us to live in that confidence and help us to be confident in sharing the good news of Jesus Christ with others in our area of influence. Father, we praise you and thank you, the great promise keeper. In Jesus' name, amen.